All right, so this is practice test two, and it's just a walkthrough of it. So the first thing you want to be, remember to do to um, prepare for this test is to look at the review sheet, which is right here. Um, and as you can see, it's broken up into sections. The first section is the people and their stories, and that's this is going to be like in the previous uh, test. Uh, but now it's the part of their stories that happens in the middle section of the book, right? So um, we are looking at up through, let's just get this down. The portion of the book that we're talking with here is out, right? Um, and so that's from chapter 9 to chapter 16. We want to know about what happens to these people in those chapters. Okay, so the first question in the uh, practice test is about Scott, the former nurse in Tobin's trailer park who has become evicted, uh, addicted to heroin, right? And what, what happens to him? So his outcome is described in the chapter... Um, called high tolerance and actually a couple of questions on the test are going to be about going to be drawn from this chapter so this is the chapter among other things where uh, um, Desmond talks about uh, how there isn't much of a culture of solidarity amongst the people in the trailer park, they all tend to regard themselves as just passing through, right? Um, and so uh, another way of putting it is that um, uh, no, well, what, what Desmond says is no one regards the poor as more undeserving than the poor themselves, at least in this trailer park. So uh, the title of this chapter, High Tolerance, is a, it has a double meaning. On the one hand, it's about um, Scott and his heroin addiction, right, because you develop a tolerance to, to drugs, but also, um, uh, well, on the, the title is mentioned on page 182. Um, Every so often, uh, Tobin's tenants would air a passing remark about their landlord's profits or call him a greedy Jew. But for the most part, the tenants had a high tolerance for inequality, right? So tenants have a high tolerance for inequality, and Scott has a high tolerance for heroin. Um, and so this is also the chapter where we talk about, um, uh, they say, according to the tenants in the trailer park, evictions were deserved. And they, they were understood to be the outcomes of individual failure, and they helped get rid of the riffraff. No one thought of the poor more undeserving than the poor themselves. Well, at the end of this chapter, what's happening with Scott is um, he's trying to get into a rehab program. Um, he gets there, and there are 15 people already in line. This is on page 184. Um, and uh, they say that they can uh, take five people. So... Um, the line stood and tightened. Scott t stepped toward the elevator and pushed the down button. He could have tried again the next day, but he went on a three-day bender instead. So, um, unable to find a spot in the rehab program, he goes on a three-day bender. Um, this uh, The second item here comes close to happening. Um, he calls his mother, and she says that uh, he can he can come home. But he doesn't actually go home, not yet. Um, okay. So the other character we ask about in the practice test is um, Arlene, right? Uh, so what's going on with Arlene? This is in the chapter on uh, her, her fate is decided or is described in uh, the chapter on um, called A Nuisance. Um, and basically, I highlighted the wrong thing here. Uh, where am I? So um, she was evicted, but the new tenant, Crystal, is letting her stay and her kids stay in the apartment. 
However, uh, Sharina is planning to evict her again because the property has been labeled a nuisance. Um, and so this will be talked about in actually the video on nuisance properties, which I'm recording after this one. Um, but uh, they get the properties declared a nuisance because there's a domestic violence happening. Um, and the person who winds up being evicted after all of that is Arlene and her kids. So, um, question three is, uh, is actually returning us to the chapter on high, uh, called High Tolerance. Again, uh, this is about the fact that there's not much of a sense of, uh, there's no fertile ground for a protest movement in the trailer park because people don't feel themselves as united. Um, and so at this point, um, Desmond goes back to uh, sociologists Francis F Fox Piven and Richard Cloward. Um, and he says, um, that in order for a protest movement to emerge out of the, quote, daily traumas of everyday life, this is on page 180, um, the social arrangements that are ordinarily perceived as just and immutable must come to be seen both as unjust and immutable. So protests that have been previously, conditions that had previously been thought of as just must be seen as unjust. And this is not something that's going on in the trailer park. They just all accept the fact that Tobin makes, uh, they think he makes a million a year. It's really only about a half million, but uh, far more than they do, right? Um, and then conditions that people previously regarded as changeable, ha unchangeable, have to be seen as changeable. You have to regard the status quo as something that is unjust and something you are capable of changing. Um, and uh, the other one that happens in here is that people must identify themselves as members of a larger group. They have to stop seeing themselves as just passing through the trailer park, but actually as having a common interest with everyone in the trailer park. Okay, um, so the two things that aren't necessary f for a protest movement to emerge, according to Desmond, at least he doesn't mention them, are a charismatic leader, he doesn't mention that, or a plan of action, right? Um, so those two aren't uh, part of the answer here. Okay, and then for question four, we jump forward again to the, sec the chapter on nuisance ordinances. In that chapter, we saw that Desmond um, uh, kept track of what kinds of things led properties to be declared nuisances and uh, domestic violence was a common thing. So what happened, what happened in Arlene's apartment is there was domestic violence going on in the apartment upstairs. Uh, Crystal calls the police about it. The police then report the um, apartment as a nuisance apartment and tell the landlord that they have to do something about it. And then um, uh, the landlord decides to do something about it, but it's not doesn't have anything to do with the people upstairs, and it doesn't have anything to do with Crystal, who was calling the police. She decides to evict Arlene. Um, so, in any case, uh, the in response to in Desmond's. Uh, writing about how domestic violence is a leading cause of um, properties being declared nuisances, uh, the police clarify, the police in the city clarify that actually domestic violence will no longer be considered um, part of the nuisance ordinance. Um, but as he explains in note 11, which is on page... Um, M I three seventy four. Um, he doesn't think that carving out an exception for domestic violence is going to actually protect victims of domestic violence. 
Um, and he gives two reasons for this. This is again on page 374. Um, the first is that domestic violence incidents often hide behind other um, crimes like prop property damage and um, nuisance laws still rely on landlords to reveal if nuisance activity is related to domestic violence. So back in video or in video 20, um, uh, I actually outlined this as an argument in, in standard form like this. And you can check out these PowerPoint slides online too and put them in your notes so that you can uh, it can help you with the test. So domestic violence often hides behind other crimes. Nuisance laws rely on landlords to reveal whether or not the problem was domestic violence. Therefore, conclusion, dropping domestic violence from the list of nuisance activities will not protect victims of domestic violence from the effects of the law. Um, and then the other one here is, these are all just distractors that I made up and they're not mentioned in the text. All right, so that covers, um, the first two questions are from, are on the, the character section of the review sheet, right? Um, the next two questions are from information, the second section of the review sheet, information about housing in Milwaukee in the United States. Um, the third one, uh, the third section is about the findings from the different studies that we looked at. So this is Desmond and Schulenberger, Desmond and Gersenschen, and uh, Liu et al., right? So now there are going to be three questions from those. Um, so question five is about Desmond and Schulenberger. Question six is about Desmond and Gersenschen, and question seven is about Liu et al. And in this case, um, uh, I'm asking about methods. So the main finding from Desmond and Schulenberger was that eviction is far more common than you think. Um, than th than you think. If, once you throw in all the kinds of informal evictions that are out there, right? If you don't just count court evictions, but you count informal evictions, you see that there are more, more evictions out there. So how did they do this? Well, they asked a series of six questions about the, uh, each move that the individual had experienced in the last two years. And, they, and that enabled them to capture both formal and informal evictions. Uh, so Gersench, Desmond and Gersenschen was about eviction and job loss. So we all have it in our minds, it's kind of obvious, that if you lose your job, you might wind up being evicted. What Desmond and Gersenschen point out is that uh, the relationship can actually go in the opposite direction. Um, that is, sometimes... Once you're evicted, it causes you to lose your job. And so this is another situation where you see feedback cycles, where um, uh, one negative, one harmful thing causes another harmful thing, and that other harmful thing goes back and turns around and causes the first harmful thing. Um, and this is part of what leads to the destabilization of neighborhoods. So in any case, um, what they had to do here was determine move from correlation uh, that job loss and eviction are correlated to uh, causation, right? And that's always a tricky move. That was something that I emphasized earlier on. Um, so how did they do, how did they show that? Well, since you're moving from correlation to causation, ultimately what you need to do is something like an experimental setup. Um, and so what they, um, in this case, uh, they don't, they can't perform experiments. They can't like fire, cause people to lose their jobs or their apartments, but they can segregate the population into two groups. Um, so they, met, um, they look at a, a one group, which it, uh, of people who experienced a forced move before they experienced a job loss. And then another group of people who had not experienced a forced move. Um, and 
once they segregate things out like that, they can identify the causal um, uh, uh, relationship. They also ran their analysis backwards and found a much weaker job between uh, uh, a much weaker relationship, much weaker correlation between first losing your job and then being evicted. All right, and so the final thing in this is uh, from Liu et al. Um, Liu et al. wrote The Color of Wealth, um, and one of their main claims there was that we should focus on um, a wealth gap rather than an income gap, um, and they also said we should focus on a racial wealth gap. Um, but this question here is just about the wealth gap point of it. So why focus on wealth rather than income? Well, um, wealth inequality drives income inequality. When people have a storehouse of wealth, um, that enables them to do things that creates income inequality, uh, a difference in their income from other people's. And so what's going on here? Well, wealth allows people to weather hard times. Um, it, if you lose your job because of a lockdown, you've got savings to fall back on. And wealth in good times, wealth allows people to invest and profit. So if you have money stored up, you're better off in hard times and you're better off in good times. So these two premises here lead to this, which is like an intermediate conclusion. Wealth inequality drives income inequality. Um, and that, then that gets us to our final point, that it, which is just that wealth, it, wealth inequality is ultimately the big deal in our society and not income inequality. The last three questions are from the last section of the review sheet. Um, this is all stuff on analyzing scientific events. So to understand this material, you need to look at the PowerPoint and the presentation, uh, the video on um, analyzing scientific events. So all of this was discussed in module six. So video 14, video 15, video 16, and video 17 have this information. Um, and you can download the PowerPoint slides and get that information there. And so all of this is about uh, getting some understanding of the scientific method, enough of the understanding of the scientific method to allow us to um, understand the scientific results that Desmond and his, his uh, co-authors come up with. So let's go back to the practice test. Um, so what I did in those videos is I presented something called the semantic view of theories. Um, which I feel is a common way, a simple way of understanding what a scientific theory is that helps us deal with practical situations like this. Um, so uh, I outlined the semantic view of theories in video 15. Um, uh, and on slide 15, I, I talk about the crucial fact of the semantic view of theories. On this view, a theory is a set of models and hypotheses that connect those models to the world. So all the time these days you hear about models in science. You hear about models of um, COVID spread and you hear mo about models of climate change. You hear about models of the economy. Um, modeling is crucial to the scientific process and models are like maps. So how are, how are models like maps? They simplify the world. They represent the world. Um, and they're connected to the world by like social conventions or hypotheses. So in the video, I talk about the physical model. This is drawing on the work of Ron Geary, um, that um, Watson and Crick used to, mo to uh, discover the structure of DNA. It was just a physical model, um, like, you know, you might make out of Legos or something. Um, and 
what this was is a simplified representation of the world. And in that sense, it's like a map. Um, the thing to see here, um, actually, is that these two items, there and there, um, are the false items on this question. And those are important. It's important that they're false. So uh, this, uh, the middle item here says, just as the same kind of map is useful in all situations, so too will a single scientific theory be useful in all situations. That is, that's a false answer, and it's important that that's false. First of all, if you think about it, you'd realize that a, the same kind of map is not useful in all situations. Sometimes, for instance, you need to know elevation, and sometimes you don't. The same thing is true of theories. Um, you're not going to have one theory that is useful in all situations, because they all simplify the world in different ways. Um, and the other thing is that models and maps aren't true or false. Um, or if they are, they're all false, right? Um, a, a perfectly true theory of the world would be like a map that is actual size. It would be useless. Um, so maps, aren't, maps and models aren't true or false. They are useful or not useful in certain situations. So in those videos, we also talk about um, ran, about sampling methods. So this comes up actually twice in video 15 and video 17. Um, a random sample, which is the ideal kind of sample, is a sample in which each member of the population has an equal chance of being in the sample. Um, and then there were other kinds of samples I asked you to look at, including a stratified sample which is the, the stratified sample was the method that uh, Matthew Desmond used in the Milwaukee area renter survey, MARS. Um, that was a survey where the population is broken up into smaller subgroups, which are then sampled randomly in order to ensure that all major parts of the population that you want to represent are represented. Um, so actually, um, the last item on this list um, is uh, not the definition of a random sample. That one's the definition of a stratified sample. And the very last question is uh, the definition of epistemology. This is the first slide in video 15. And this is something I ask in every question because epistemology is one of the fundamental branches of philosophy. And it's really important. Um, it's part of what I was trained in. It's how I got into this business. Epistemology is the study of knowledge, what it is and how to get it. Um, and I think people don't realize enough that there are plenty of scholars, scientists, sociologists, philosophers who study the process of gathering knowledge itself um, and that this is actually vital to the whole process, I mean, of knowing. Okay, so uh, that is the practice test. The final test, the real test, will contain t questions drawn from pools um, that cover these same areas. They won't be the exact same questions, but they will follow the review sheet in the same fashion. There will be a question about Liu at all and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, the, the test is open book and open note. So I encourage you to have well-organized notes and a well-annotated book.